Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk, our podcast series produced and delivered to you by Hazel and Betty Ford. I'm your host, William C. Moyers. Thanks for joining us for this important conversation about what parents need to know when it comes to vaping, nicotine, and their children. Welcome, Dr. Polly. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here today. Let's just get right to it. What is vaping? Yes, so vaping, I'm so happy we're having this conversation because I think those of us in the field have been like trying to raise red flags saying something is happening here, this is a really big deal. But vaping is the use of what's called an electronic delivery device where you, it's like a device and some of them come pre-filled and look sort of like a cigarette. Or like a pen, Yeah, right? or like a pen yeah. or like a little square, like a little yes. metal square. Some of them have these pods that have like juice in them, what they would call juice that you can pop in and out that have different kinds contents of nicotine within the juice. Mm. And then you basically, it, the device heats up and vaporizes the juice that has the nicotine in it, and then you inhale the vapor. And so when people are vaping, they're essentially doing an analog to smoking where they're putting something up to their mouth and then they're delivering themselves nicotine into their lungs. And nicotine is a drug. That's right. Nicotine is the addictive drug in tobacco cigarettes, in you know um, chew that people use. It, yes, it's nicotine is the drug. Is vaping safer than that stick of tobacco that's burning at one end? Yeah, that's an interesting question because the reason vaping or electronic delivery devices were invented was to try to get tobacco smokers to ease off of use of tobacco cigarettes because tobacco cigarettes are so toxic and mm -hmm. cause so many issues that I think many of us know about. And so it was almost like a harm reduction strategy mm -hmm. to say like, look, like tobacco is so bad for you. Can we get you to do this electronic delivery device? The problem is, is that it's new and we don't have long-term studies. And so I just always remember back to the beginning of tobacco, right, where people People would say this is great there's no health problems associated with it and then 20 30 years later we were like oh no <laughs> like people are getting cancer this is not good and the worry is is that the same thing will happen with vaping or electronic delivery devices because it's not just nicotine or water that's going to your lung it's all kinds of other chemicals as well and there's a reason why you're sitting on this set as our medical director of our youth continuum and I'm asking you about vaping because it is prevalent particularly with young people. Yes, and that's why we've been raising red flags, is it's an anomaly when I have a young person come in that is not addicted to nicotine. <sighs> I would say, you know, more than 90% of my patients have a dependence on nicotine. 90%? Yes, it's like I said, it's, a, it's an anomaly if I have somebody who hasn't been regularly using nicotine to the point that they're having withdrawal and they're physically dependent on it. And so how do you balance the treatment that they may be coming in for, for an opioid use disorder or, or yeah. alcoholism with their dependence on nicotine. Yeah, so the approach we take at the youth continuum, our facility is a, a tobacco or nicotine free facility. Completely. Yes, and so we, our patients are not allowed to use nicotine and we consider nicotine to be a, a substance of abuse and we help people to get off of nicotine just as we help them get off of other substances. And so we use nicotine replacement products and other types of medication in addition to therapy and behavioral support mm -hmm. to really help them to understand that nicotine is a substance just like other substances. There has been some pushback um, in society uh, about the use of vaping. Uh, this, what is the pushback? Where, where do we begin to get worried about it? What's been the red flags early on? Because it's still a relatively new technology delivery yeah. system. W what are we seeing? Yeah, well, I think so. The original purpose, again, was to kind of be used for patients who are already addicted to tobacco cigarettes to try to reduce harm. Uh -huh. And I think the problem is, right, is that commercialization happened. People realized, know that nicotine is an addictive substance. And the same thing that happened with tobacco cigarettes is playing out with vaping, where it's, let's, you know, advertise these as safe. Let's advertise them as fun. Let's get young people hooked when they're 12, 15, so that then they're lifelong addicts and continue to buy our product. And so that, you know, and sadly, I think we probably could have predicted that this would happen because yeah. it's what happens with all addictive substances yes. is people want to make money off of our brains and our tendency to become addicted to things. And so, yeah, so there's been a lot of, you know, concerns surrounding particular types of products, flavoring in products, flavoring. you know, um, marketing that might be targeted more towards young people. And the other thing about vaping from a, parental perspective is that it's it's harder to detect it yes. than if you walk into your son or daughter's room and there's a cloud of tobacco smoke. 
Yes, that yeah, that's right, and it's so it, and it's very easy to hide the devices because they're so small. You know, in treatment, that's actually we have to have special protocols to try to because kids will try to hide them and bring them into treatment because they're oh. so addicted to nicotine that even though they know it's against the rules, they can't imagine that they wouldn't be able to use nicotine or vape while they're in treatment. So they try to sneak it in, and it's really easy to conceal because they're just these small devices. Some of them actually don't contain much metal at all, so they won't even set off a metal detector. Mm -hmm. and you know, kids are a lot of kids are bringing them to school, and they'll use them in between classes. I have some kids who have even said they've been able to use them during class. And if there is any kind of residual vapor, they just kind of blow it into their clothing, and they keep the device kind of in their backpack, and they bend over like they're getting something from their backpack. And you know, schools are you know I've talked with some in, people who are leaders of schools, and it's like they have so many other things that they're worried about. That yes. the idea that these kids might be using these vapes, it's like they can't police that. And so many kids come in, and they're used to using their vape and getting nicotine, you know, very frequently throughout the day, which is different than tobacco cigarettes, right? Like, mm -hmm. again, you can't, you couldn't kind of smoke a tobacco cigarette in school as a 14 year old right. and not have somebody know, right. you know, and you need to go out for a break because you can't do it inside if you're an adult. And so, and that's not the case with vaping. Is there a way for parents to screen or otherwise pay attention to, um, their child's behavior as it relates to vaping? Yeah, I think parents should ask early and often about their child's knowledge and what their perception is about vaping and about nicotine. You know, one of the questions you can easily start with is, oh, so do you have any friends at school do you, like of that vape? Do you know what vaping is? Mm -hmm. And just kind of get a sense of your child's knowledge about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Generally, the rule of thumb is that if your child has friends who vape, it's really only a matter of time before they start to vape themselves. And so it's important, again, Again, to educate yourself as a parent about what vaping is, about the really risks associated with nicotine use in young people, which there are plenty, and to try to educate your child about that and have a dialogue with them. And again, kind of set limits and say, you know, it's against the rules in our family for you to use nicotine or for you to vape, and this would be the consequence if I found out that you were doing that. And I know we're focusing on vaping and nicotine, but the reality is, is that when we talk about vaping, we have to talk about it in the context of um, the how it can be used to ingest other substances. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and so that's particularly where some of the dangerous part comes in is that, you know, illicit people who make illicit substances realized, oh, we could use these electronic delivery devices and try to make a separate pod that contains other types of chemicals or addictive mm. things so that the person could swap out the nicotine pod and put in a pod that has other types of drugs or substances. And so it's really common now for people to be able to get cannabis or marijuana in a pod that can like flip into uh, an electronic delivery device that's typically used for nicotine. And so you'll hear sometimes in the news about these kind of outbreaks of, of you know, acute lung injury yes, yes. where young people are being hospitalized. And we had that happen in Minnesota a couple of years ago. And the reason for that was that there was illicitly made pods with marijuana that people were putting into their electronic delivery devices. And those pods contained chemicals that they wouldn't normally contain in the nicotine version, which were then toxic to the lung and actually caused really significant lung damage to the point that when I was doing outpatient work, I had some patients that required a lung transplant oh. secondary to the fact that they had used one of these illicit pods that then damaged their lungs beyond the point that they could be repaired. So the myth that vaping is safer than um, tobacco is, is, is a myth because it might be safer in this context of the burning gases that are running yeah. through the tobacco, but you just pointed it out. They're deadly dangerous. Yeah. Well, and we know that if someone's vaping nicotine, that their barrier to, to buy an illicit pod and to vape something else yes. goes down. And so that, you know, vaping nicotine is a risk factor for the use of other substances or a risk factor for the use of obtaining one of these illicit pods. What's your, your counsel to parents who do find um, evidence of that their child is vaping? How should the, the parent parent have the conversation yeah. about what happens next. Yeah, well, I think one of the most important pieces is to try to remain calm. <laughs> These situations are really hard and cause a lot of feelings for parents. And so, you know, but you're, it's gonna be really hard to make progress and join with your child if you're getting aggressive or reactive or kind of reactionary. You know, I think it's important to take the items. I, again, that seems so obvious, but I've met parents that are like, well, we didn't take the vape. We let, we kept, we, we let them keep it. And we just said, we didn't like that they were using it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, take the vape from them, yeah. you know, 
know, talk to them about consequences for engaging in that behavior. You know, a hard part is that I think young people underestimate how addictive nicotine is and the young brain is actually more sensitive to becoming dependent on nicotine more quickly than an adult brain is. And so there's some research that indicates that even after one to two days of kind of, you know, using it intermittently throughout the day, the brain is already dependent and will crave nicotine. And so a lot of kids, when you take the vape away, will then experience symptoms of nicotine withdrawal. And so those can be treated using nicotine replacement in the similar ways to what we do with adults or they can be treated kind of with comfort measures, huh. education, kind of saying, yes, it's gonna be harder for you to sleep, you're not gonna have an appetite, you're gonna be cranky, um, <laughs> but you know, that's because you're withdrawing from nicotine and it will pass. If parents get to the point where their child is dependent on um, substances, whatever that substance is, and they also are vaping, mm -hmm. is it realistic for the parents to look for a treatment program that is going to um, address all those issues at one time, or is it okay for the treatment facility to deal with the alcohol misuse or the addiction to opiates? Yeah, well, I think it's really important for parents to seek out a treatment that would not allow any substances for their child. I always find it so interesting that we've sort of decided that nicotine in the treatment world was okay and you could smoke and go to treatment and it wasn't a big deal. And then we drew the line with cannabis, like, no, you, but you can't use cannabis. And a lot of young people nowadays will point out, like, well, that doesn't make any sense because the research about nicotine is that it also hurts my brain. So why have you arbitrarily decided? And I think that can be confusing. And I think young people will look for those kind of holes and say, <laughs> so this whole thing doesn't make any sense then because of this kind of discre like this discrepancy that I'm noticing. And so I <laughs> I think just delivering the message that like, no, you're young, your brain is sensitive, there's really no amount of substance that's helpful for you, so no, we're not making an exception for nicotine. Dr. Polly, what is the impact of nicotine on the developing brain? Yeah, so there's been studies that have come out that kind of originated with tobacco use, and then there's been some more that have come out with the initiation of vaping and that mm -hmm. use of nicotine. But really, nicotine impacts the brain of a young person differently than the brain of an adult. It, it kind of slows down the development of the prefrontal cortex, which is that front part of the brain that helps with decision making, mm -hmm. impulse control, um, and planning. And so it, it, in some ways, creates what looks like ADHD in young people mm -hmm. because it's sort of preventing their prefrontal cortex from doing the job that it needs to do. And we've found that actually that those def differences can persist past the time where the person stops using nicotine oh. or even if they cut down into an adult into adulthood and so what i've wondered is if we're what we will see now with this generation of individuals and young people whose brains are being nearly constantly exposed to nicotine from vaping if we'll see an increased rate of adult onset or adult ADHD, or if we'll see increasing, you know, addiction in adulthood now to other substances, if we'll see, a, you know, increases in impulsivity or anger management difficulty, all the kinds of things that you might see if you have impairment in the development of the prefrontal cortex. It was a, a I know this, a, I think this occurred before you joined us about a year and a half ago, but we did, we, Hazel and Betty Ford, did ban the use of nicotine on our youth campus and mm -hmm. that was true for patients and for their parents and yeah. for um, our employees. That was a good idea, yes? Yes, oh definitely. And I think there's movement in the field in general to really stop allowing nicotine in treatment programs um, mm -hmm. because we know that the outcomes are actually better. So they've done studies about how do people do when they leave treatment if they were allowed to use nicotine versus not allowed to use nicotine products. And people actually are more successful in their recovery and abstinence from other substances if they're not using nicotine. And is that true both for youth and for adults? Yes, that's true for youth and adults. So. I hate to go down this this path, but d do you feel strongly as a, as a doctor and as a doctor who works in the field of addiction medicine that um, nicotine should be uh, voided at all treatment facilities? Yeah, I do support that. I mean, I think, again, I think there's kind of this weird inconsistency that we've decided that nicotine is okay, but, you know, cannabis is not okay. And I think that that leaves us open to you know, a lot of patients kind of deciding that we don't know what we're talking about or kind of putting us to the side mm -hmm. because 
it, it's a reasonable argument. Why is nicotine okay, but cannabis is not okay? I mean, they're both harmful. They both impact your brain. Mm -hmm. you know, but we have to have the line somewhere, right? Because then caffeine comes into the picture too, right? right? It's like a lot of people misuse caffeine. Um, and so, you know, we would have then, and I think we do sort of talk about setting limits on, no, you yes. can't just drink Red Bull Energy drinks right. all day long because that's also <laughs> going to hurt your brain. <laughs> but, you know, so yes, I do, I would support and I do think that I would like for the field to move in the direction of just not allowing nicotine in treatment programs. Mm -hmm. And we know that nicotine, um, particularly smoking, we know it killed the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill yeah. Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith. They, they, they found recovery from their alcoholism and they essentially smoked themselves to death yeah. because nicotine is an addictive drug that yeah. is difficult to get off of. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do people beat nicotine addiction? Yeah. The nicotine addiction is rough. I mean, if anyone's never, like I grew up with parents that smoked and you know, it's like I, it's horrible to try to quit smoking. I think people try so hard and it's just really hard. So again, I think it's this kind of like multidisciplinary approach and they've shown that in research that really combination of medications that can assist with smoking cessation in addition to behavioral interventions is really the way to go and will offer kind of the most success. And so they talk about setting a quit date as being really important, oh. um, planning ahead of the quit date as to what barriers you might have to being able to be successful and then really having a comprehensive plan for yourself that offers behavioral support in addition to you know nicotine replacement options or some prescription medications we have available that have mm -hmm. shown to help with smoking cessation. Does insurance cover those um those prescriptions? Yes, yes, thankfully yes. So I think insurance companies figured out, right, that it's more expensive for us to have smokers because of all the things that are gonna to happen to them if they keep smoking than it is for us to pay for these options to help people stop smoking. So yes, and even for young people now actually, insurances are covering nicotine replacement really? and other types of medications. Again, oh. because they know that yeah. it saves them money if they do that now versus yeah. allow the addiction to continue. And the last question before we go, because I know there'll be people tuning in who see that we're promoting this as vaping and, and nicotine, but, the, and, but they, they may not be vaping, but they're hooked on nicotine. What is your response, Dr. Polly, to the argument or to the case that um, if somebody comes in with a dependence on alcohol and they're also dependent on nicotine, best that we address the alcohol addiction first yeah. and let the nicotine addiction get addressed later on or after they leave treatment. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. It almost makes me feel like we're underestimating people. Huh. And I don't, it, because it's like, why? <laughs> like, do we have any evidence to suggest that it, they can't also, they can't focus on those two things at the same time. I don't know if we have that evidence. And I think it, again, it kind of sends this message that, you know, one thing is okay and the other thing isn't okay, or one thing is worse than the other thing. And why, why do we send that message? Like, I don't understand, you know, to me, it's like, what's the relevance? Why do we need to make that distinction? Yes. I think people are very capable. And if somebody could stop, I don't know why you couldn't stop smoking or using nicotine and alcohol at the same time. Dr. Sarah Polly, thank you yeah. for bringing your really intriguing and insightful um, expertise mm -hmm. to um, our Let's Talk podcast today because I know there are a lot of parents, a lot of educators, and a lot of young people who will benefit from what you have shared with us today. Dr. Sarah Polly, thanks for being with us. Mm -hmm. And thanks to all of you for tuning in for our Let's Talk podcast series. On behalf of our executive producer, Lisa Stangle, and the crew at Blue Moon Productions, I'm your host, William C. Moyers. We'll see you again. <laughs>